interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. December 7, 1941, the Japanese air fleet bombed Pearl Harbor. They came in three waves on a quiet Sunday, starting a little bit before 8 a.m., and unleashed bomb after bomb on the Pacific force of the U.S. Navy, which was at anchor there. I had just come home from church, and then we kept hearing, you know, Pearl Harbor was bombed, Pearl Harbor was bombed. I had no idea where Pearl Harbor was. Then when I went back to school that following morning, you know, December 8th, one of the teachers said, you people bombed Pearl Harbor, and I'm going, my people, you know. All of a sudden, my Japanese-ness became very aware to me, you know, and then that I was no longer, I no longer felt I'm an equal American, that I felt kind of threatened and nervous about it. As a result, the U.S. declared war the following day, December 8th, uh, 1941. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our West Coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens, one-third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. The U.S. had a large population of Japanese-American citizens. They had been born there, they had been working there all their lives. This group of people immediately became the enemy within. Suspicions uh, rose high, and the, they were considered a threat above all to security at home. There were more Japanese in Los Angeles than in any other area. At nearby San Pedro, houses and hotels, occupied almost exclusively by Japanese, were within a stone's throw of a naval air base, shipyards, oil wells. Japanese fishermen had every opportunity to watch the movement of our ships. Japanese farmers were living close to vital aircraft plants. Just a few months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the government decided to take official action. They did so by issuing an executive order, 9066, which was signed by the then president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, which declared that Japanese Americans who were living in areas of particular sensitivity, for example, on the West Coast, were to be evacuated and interned. Notices were posted. All persons of Japanese descent were required to register. They were given very little time to leave their homes and thus to arrange their affairs, to settle their estates, to decide what they were to take. The conditions of evacuation were stringent. Everything that they could bring with them down to the numbers of shoes and what their children should have and the numbers of plates and forks, all of this was stipulated and put into effect with great dispatch. At the staging area, you know, they, they told us uh, what to bring. Uh, your bedding, your, your mess gear, um, your few personal belongings, but only what you can carry. We, we had no idea what our future environment was going to be, 
and um, we just selected things very carefully and, and then um, stuffed it in a bag and uh, took it to the staging area and there was uh, a bunch of uh, GIs there with rifles and fixed bayonets and they told us where to drop our bags and they motioned us on onto the uh, Greyhound bus. The Army provided fleets of vans to transport household belongings and buses to move the people to assembly centers. The evacuees cooperated wholeheartedly. The many loyal among them felt that this was a sacrifice they could make in behalf of America's war effort. Dorothy Lang was a photographer. She was commissioned by the War Relocation Authority uh, to document this process. And when we look at the photographs that document this event, you can see people collected um, to be transported uh, in buses and trains and stock cars, uh, open air. Um, all of them are registered. They have tags on their bodies and they're moved first to evacuation centers, which make use of fairgrounds and race courses. And from there, they were dispatched to some sort of internment camp. All of these were in non-sensitive areas, which means when translated into non-government speak, arid, barren, distant places where life was hard. Lang, of course, was conflicted about the work because she knew very well um, that what she was doing was documenting uh, an injustice which had been visited on her fellow citizens. Our assembly center was Tanferan Racetrack, which is located 15 miles away from home. And of course, the racetrack was still in business when the war broke out, but they hastily made that into our assembly center because it had us a railroad siding so that they could whisk us out again later. When we entered the gate, we knew it was pretty uh, Final, I could say, when you enter the gates and the soldier, armed soldiers standing guard and there's barbed wire fences all around, we thought, well, this is it. The entire community, bounded by a wire fence and guarded by military police, symbols of the military nature of the evacuation. Surveillance um, was the prime mover behind the establishment of such a camp. Uh, it had watchtowers along its edges and lights. Uh, it was not meant to be escaped from, and um, surveillance extended to the uh, soldiers who were watching the internees round the clock. There were plenty of things that Dorothy Lang was not allowed to photograph. Um, for example, barbed wire, for example, uh, soldiers bearing weapons against unarmed citizens as they assembled and as they then lived their lives in internment camps. We lost everything we had and, and we're uh, going to, uh, to lose our freedom. I mean, we became uh, instant uh, POWs. We got captured by the GIs. And when I got, got into Santa Anita, I'm thinking, uh, what am I doing in a concentration camp? Dorothea Lang wasn't the only photographer to work at Manzanar. The most unusual one, uh, was one who didn't have the freedom to leave. This was Toyo Miyatake, uh, a Japanese-American um, who in civilian life was a photographer. When he came to Manzanar, he smuggled into the camp uh, a ground glass and a lens 
and a bit of film and the wherewithal to put these together in a homemade camera, which was um, disguised as a lunchbox, curiously enough. The lens was welded onto a length of short pipe and the whole thing became a simple but actually very effective camera, which he used clandestinely to document life at camp. He certainly was able to document some aspects of camp life which we otherwise wouldn't know and wouldn't see. He's the one who shows us the barbed wire uh, in two clearly staged photographs, but photographs whose purpose um, in arranging three young boys next to the wire is to tell a story which otherwise was not to be seen, and that is that everyone there was behind this barrier at which the three children were posed. Uh, his photographs show us the watchtower, not um, the man with the gun up in it, but we can see um, that surveillance was the norm at the camp at Manzanar, as it was indeed at all the other camps. And then he shows us much more about life which we otherwise wouldn't have understood. And I, I, again, I think that we're um, face to face with something very special about life um, within these camps, and that is that life went on. There's no question that the internment process and the sojourn away from their lives had an enormous effect on those who were subjected to it. Um, speaking materially, the um, you know the loss of property, wealth, momentum, all of that was, must have been enormous. Um, I think it, it's estimated as somewhere between six and twelve billion dollars. Is we're just sort of in terms of the collective. Um, possessions of these people just evaporated. And when reparations were eventually made in 1988, it took that long, um, individuals got like $20,000 a piece. I mean, a pitiful, pitiful recompense for the absolute destabilization of their lives, to say nothing of their livelihoods. Looking back at the events on the west coast of 1941-1942, the evacuation of Japanese Americans and their internment can't help but bring to mind, I think, some of the more intolerant aspects of our lives today. I do think that it must strike a chord um, with people who, are, who think about what happened in the U.S. in the 1940s to uh, citizens. The reason I think it seems so relevant and so important to think about now is because um, there is such an outpouring uh, in Europe, in America, against people who seem different. In my own country, in the U.S., there is real antipathy now, real Islamophobia, and has been ever since um, the bombings that occurred on 9-11. And this backlash against difference um, is as worrisome today as it was problematic in the 1940s.